Good morning. And this uh, current panel discussion is going to relate to the three speakers uh, prior to our session, the issue of democracy. Why are we dealing with democracy? This is uh, the institute that uh, revolves around security issues and not democracy, but there is no doubt that, uh, as we saw in the survey presented yesterday by Tsipi, there is a fear within the public, uh, the situation democracy. This is something that arises from the public at large, and there is no doubt that uh, Sustaining democracy is one of the central and important components for our national security, and this is why it's a very relevant issue. However, when we talk about democracy, we hear all sorts of opinions within the public. There are those who say democracy is in danger, there is a crisis, uh, it has uh, collapsed or about to collapse. On the other hand, some people say that our situation has never been stronger. Uh, this uh, controversy shows it. Uh, there is a minority that doesn't take upon itself the majority's opinion and covers their political uh, ideas with some sort of a general statement regarding democracy. In order to know who's right, first of all, we need to ask what is democracy? Democracy includes the uh, majority's rule, as one of the speakers said yesterday, this is not the only thing. It's also uh, democratic values without which we don't have essential democracy. And the question upon which uh, the argument revolves is what are these values? What uh, is included in these values and how are we going to balance these and other interests. So in this panel discussion, we will try and answer this very important question. We will relate, if time allows, four different levels. The first one is national interest versus democratic values. The second will be human rights of the individual or of the other, of the enemy, someone who is not of our own. The third topic that we also we already heard about is the independence of the legal system and the gatekeepers. I heard that Professor Hari is not fond of this uh, term, but who is keeping uh, this independence and freedom of speech and criticism. In order to talk about these four levels, we have a very distinguished uh, panel, Dr. Yehuda Ben Meir, Professor Alex Jacobson, Dr. Yehuda Ben Meir, one of the senior researchers and our uh, maybe smartest ones in our institution. Uh, we see Professor Alex Jacobson from the history department at Hebrew University, Professor Susie Navot from the uh, Administration Mar College, Mr. Mar ben Ror Yamini, a senior journalist in Yediot Achonot newspaper. And then we have Ms. Liat Schlesinger, the CEO of Mulad, the Center for Renewing Democracy. Ms. Sarah Haetzni Cohen, the chairperson of Israel Sheli, Zionist activity on social uh, networks. And Dr. Aviad Bakshi, he's a uh, professor at the bar -Ilan University. So thank you very much. Uh, to all the participants, and I'm moving along. And I'll start with the first um, topic. We have uh, a timetable, and I'm going to be very strict. You have your allotted time slots. The first uh, topic we talk about are national interest versus democratic values. And like any one of those topics, I'm going to relate to steps that have been taken recently who provoked this uh, turmoil discussion is democracy and risk or not. The first one is national state law, uh, which states that the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. The um, the right to live in Israel is unique to the Jewish people. 
settlement here should be promoted, some sort of a treatment to the Arab language, and the law does not include a treatment of equality for minorities. Another issue that came up uh, yesterday was uh, our treatment of the Arab minority. There is a five-year plan. On the other hand, there are statements of senior uh, political uh, leaders who relate to the Arab minorities as traitors, as a danger to Israel. Uh, there are no condemnations. Uh, some might say that they are calling to violence against Arabs. And the third point relates to the policy in Judea and Samaria, particularly ideas that come up recently from within the government and coalition regarding annexation of parts of the West Bank to Israel, whether there are settlement clusters or a broader annexation of the entire sea area, the entire bank, the West Bank, and maybe the feeling is that we're going towards one state where there is not necessarily complete equality to all citizens or the Palestinians. All of this takes us to the statement that there is a strengthening of the national dimension and harm to democracy in Israel. And this is something that I'm opening up for discussion here. Thank you. Democracy and national values. We're talking about two values that are not the two extremes of one axis. They don't conflict. They can be integrated. And so nation state law does not harm democracy. I think we need to differentiate three uh, aspects of rights. I'll talk about national state law and the Arab minorities. We have the individual rights, some are citizens' rights, human rights. They need to be given to each and every person and citizen with no uh, difference whatsoever. We have the community uh, rights, which is less anchored in the, in the legal uh, system in Israel, but we're doing relatively okay in here, which is providing rights to the community, for example, education in the Arab language and such thing. But there's also the level of of a national definition. And the idea here is based on the fact that regarding this uh, self-definition, self-national definition, unlike individual rights, there is exclusivity for the nation which is uh, having a right to define itself. In our case, the Jewish nationality. Some are challenging this approach. And for example, Adala's uh, petition against the joint party says there is no legitimacy for this uh, nation state. Either it's an uh, old citizen or a multinational or a binational. If you have this approach, then you might have problem with other uh, parts of uh, the Israeli law. This is an approach which does not characterize the state of Israel, and the national state law comes to say that on the level of self-definition, self-national definition, Israel is the uh, national state of the Jewish people. It does not harm the right of equality, which uh, is anchored very well in Israeli law. Those are organizations who are going to the Court of Appeals and are saying that the national state law completely distorted the Israeli legal system and there's no protection of equality, have signed other petitions that um, sometimes would ask to negate uh, government decisions and legislation. So harm to equality or the right for equality was not harmed and uh, for sure this does not uh, replace demos, which is all of the citizens and only citizens, and no matter what religion and gender, of course, it is based on the law that the ones who elect for the Israeli parliament are only its citizens. And so there is no conflict. There are, however, events of tension. There are situations like, for example, uh, if we have infiltrators, or if we have family reunifications, uh, uh, or the immigration of uh, foreigners into the state of Israel. This uh, provokes tension between the private and the national. And this requires a balance. It's not any superiority of one value over the other, even after national state law. We have to find the balance. And when I'm adding a right, this does not entail that I detracted of another right, although there are situations where a balance is required. There is a tension between 
the right of the freedom of speech and the right of for privacy. And it is very clear that when I add freedom of speech, I don't harm the right of privacy. Although there are conflict situations where the right for privacy, in a, where there is a conflict with freedom of speech, one will uh, prevail over the other, and vice versa. One last minute. Well, it's a little difficult. But as far as the right for equality, the right of equality, as I said, is well anchored in the state of Israel, but it's not written in the fundamental laws. Its natural place is not in national state law. This deals on the national level, and there's no equality there. It should be in the uh, fundamental law of the dignity of uh, human rights. Since this law was legislated, it uh, was not added, although Tsipi Livni is raising the banner very high. She was a chairperson of the Legislative Committee, and she never bothered adding the right for equality uh, to this law. And the reason is because of the tension and the, sus and the uh, suspecting that goes on between the municipality uh, did not allow this to happen. Ultimately, it's a matter of timing. You could add the right for equality explicitly to the law. When this this comes uh, together with uh, the um, equality between the various municipalities. Thank you. The Israeli nation state law uh, has to be compared to democratic countries, not to binational uh, countries. I accept uh, the basic uh, assumption that Israel is a one-nation state and not multi-station nation state. Uh, but the rights are the rights of a national minority of uh, citizens who don't belong to the majority in a nation democratic state. And you have to compare this nation state law with other countries, not too many democratic countries who found it fit to mention specifically in their law their national uh, nature or character, their affinity to the majority, and it doesn't include all the citizens. If it includes all of them, there's no problem. But there are countries that for historical reasons uh, uh, saw fit to do what Israel decided to do, that to say that this is a Jewish state which fulfills uh, the need of the Jewish people for self-determination, this was, by the way, you said in the past as well. But I didn't think there's any problem in uh, enacting a law that says it specifically. And also, you know, the flag and the law of return and everything. I didn't think that there's anything wrong with this intention. But obviously, when a democratic state says that it belongs to the majority of its people, the Jewish people, it always says that any democratic state, even those who are less than democratic in Israel, any democratic state says, justifiably so, at this opportunity with the same breath, that it doesn't mean that it, it is not a state of citizens that don't belong to the majority. It finds it correct to mention equality, not just when you talk about individual rights, but always in the, the national definition of the state. There's no democratic legislator that doesn't do it apart, uh, apart from Israel. The is Israeli nation state law, and I've been dealing for years with uh, protecting the legitimacy of the Jewish state compared uh, to legislators in other countries. So after 20 years of dealing with this, and I know it very well, I can tell you, in the democratic uh, world, there's no similar document to the nation state law that announces uh, the Judaism of the state and refuses to say at the same opportunity that the state also belongs to the non-Jewish citizen. Because when you say that the state belongs to a certain nation or people, it can be interpreted that if it belongs to the Jewish people, it doesn't belong to anybody else who is not Jewish. And in order to negate 
this interpretation in order to say that it means that the uh, state reflects uh, the national independence of the Jewish people only, that's true, but it doesn't uh, mean uh, that uh, a Druze in this country or anybody um, uh, uh, who served in the army and he's a pilot in the army and uh, this Druze who's a very known figure, he said in that interview that he supports the Likud, he's a citizen, his son is a pilot, everything is fine and he's very proud, but he was very upset and insulted by the nation-state uh, law. So you managed to say to any Israeli citizen, even those who are loyal and right-wing, whatever, you said to them that the state refuses to say that the state or the country belongs to them as well. So you refuse to mention this. What kind of a radical left it is going to uh, accept this? Uh, a member of Knesset, Benny Begin, that apparently is more right-wing <coughs> than uh, the prime minister, but there's a tradition of the revisionist uh, movement of the Israeli democracy that says, yes, it's a state and a an, um, uh, homeland to the Jewish people, but equality to all the citizens of the state. There's no excuse. This is the crux of the matter. There's no excuse to refuse to say it loud and clear, and I don't agree. You know, people talk about interpretation. There's a whole dispute and discussion, but I can tell you, anybody who uh, formulated this law that really jeopardizes the dignity of any Israeli citizen, any citizen who wants to identify with the state, you hurt him, you harmed him, but if you think it has to do with the legislature of the Supreme Court, I don't think so. Anything that the Supreme Court will think, justifiably or not, that uh, um, uh, jeopardizes equality, it's going to uh, disqualify it. Yuda. There's no question. Yuda, then me you. My opinion on the nation state law can be summarized uh, with the headline of an article that I published in the newspaper a few days later. It was Super, superfluous uh, law, and I think that the nation state law is not anti democratic, first of all, because everything that it says also appears elsewhere. So it's superfluous. My good friend, Professor Misha Arendt, who just passed away after it was enacted, he wrote an article in the same newspaper that goes against the law. I think even the Prime Minister cannot define Arendt as a leftist. And therefore, this law, it did not take the right of anybody, so it doesn't jeopardize democracy, but it's a bad law. You know that democratic uh, regimes can enact uh, bad laws. It's bad law to the as a foundation law, which is supposed to be a foundation of the state. It shouldn't be accepted uh, 66 votes against 54, and because the motivation was political, internal, and therefore you have to correct the law. And I'm very happy that maybe the first statement of Benny Gantz was uh, to the Druze that he's going to act towards correcting the law. It has to deal with three simple things. One, in the first section, and I am happy that all the speakers here, I don't think there's any controversy here, the fact that the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. But you have to add, a dash, a Jewish and democratic state. That should have appeared in this law. And the second correction has to be what's missing. And it does appear in the scroll of independence. What's good for Ben-Gurion, should be good also for us today. In that section where it says that the state of Israel is going to be open to Jewish aliyah, for Jewish immigration, and Ben-Gurion uh, called that a foundation law, there you have to add exactly the same and we 
reacts to this uh, sense. It's true, it's open for Jewish immigration, and that's no discrimination. The moment a Jew arrives uh, in Israel, he becomes a full citizen with all the rights. We give rights to the Jewish people who were persecuted for 3,000 years. This is the place for him. But you have to add what appears also in the scroll of independence that the state of Israel will have civil and cultural equality fully to all its citizens without, uh, with no exception to religion, to race, to gender, etc. And the third correction shows uh, the uh, um, uh, incorrect uh, motivation and a very, very small majority, and that is the Arab language, Arabic language, because it says that in this law does not want to jeopardize the status of the Arabic language. So why did you write it? Because the Arabic language is very important to the Jews as well. We have many cultural assets that were written in Arab. The Rambam, the Maimonides, he wrote some of his book uh, in Arabic. And uh, therefore, it should say, uh, in that section of the language exactly what it says about the Jewish calendar. It says that the Jewish calendar uh, is going to abide by the Gregorian also, and you can say that the language will be Hebrew and Arabic uh, recognized language. And uh, be, besides these three corrections, the law is okay, very okay. Another word, 30 seconds. As for the annexation, I personally think, you know, yesterday you saw it uh, uh, in the poll. Most of the people in Israel does not want to annex Judea and Samaria. They have good sense, common sense. Uh, because of Jewish and Zionist uh, reasons in order to ensure that the state of Israel will be Jewish and democratic forever. It's obvious, as far as democracy is concerned, that if in a political arrangement or unilateral steps of the state of Israel, this part of another of uh, Judea and Samaria is going to be annexed and become a part and parcel of the state of Israel. It's obvious that all the inhabitants in that area have to be Israeli citizens and to benefit from all the rights that any Israeli citizen has. Not even three minutes after I heard uh, the last two speakers, I have nothing much to say. Apart, of course, after I heard the lecture of Professor Harari this morning, I decided that any opportunity that I have will end with some hope, uh, optimism. Otherwise, our mood is not going to be the right. The nation state law is not just a law, it's a foundation law. And uh, this is the terminology what we use. This is some of the blurring that we do. It's not just a foundation law. This is the introduction of the Israeli constitution. It's we, the people of ours. It's not we, the Jewish people. It's oh, we, the people of Israel. This is the most important chapter that actually tells the ethos of the state of Israel. The fact that the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and that it has a right for self-determination of the Jewish people only. And we have no controversy about that. This is the nation right for self-determination in the state of Israel of the Jewish people only. If I could write uh, the law, I don't think I would make too many changes to it. I think that many of the things that were said and written are correct, accurate. They really depict the Israeli reality, which we all know. But I would elaborate regarding the law of return, because this is an opportunity to turn the law of return to a foundation law. It was a good opportunity. They could say it a bit more specifically, maybe. But the problem with this, this state law is in the heart of controversy, of the discourse, because of what it does not have. It's a state of the Jews, and if the state belongs to the Jews, then anybody who's not Jewish is uh, transparent. It doesn't exist. It's not the home of all its citizens, and this cannot be corrected, except if you correct the law. The, you cannot say that, yes, they exist, but they're not really here. They're somewhere else. It's some other law, of the former one, dignity of man, and there he does have the rights. This is not going to work. 
uh, definitely not uh, in the introduction of the Constitution. Israel has to say to the world what it is, what, it, uh, what are its values and what are its principal laws. And that's exactly what's missing. These are the voids in the nation state law. The fact that this is the state of the Jewish people, but it has full equality to all its citizens. This exactly the way it says in the scroll of independence doesn't is not there. There's no equality. There are no minorities, no democracy. This is a Jewish state and democratic, and we know this formula for more than 25 years. And we decided to delete it from this nation state law. There, the state is not Jewish and democratic. It's, it's, it's only Jewish. It's only Jewish. Yeah, somebody she said democratic by mistake. And where was the vision? Where is the scroll of independence. These are the things that are missing. And I hope, and I'm still hopeful, that the first thing, the first flag uh, of any government, of any government should be a correction and completion of this uh, law. We deserve a constitution. This is how Israel is going to be at its best. Thank you. Opportunity to respond in the next few sessions, but let us move on to the next level, which was also touched upon by Judge Chayut, and that is the balance between human rights, and particularly the human rights of the enemy, of the other, and other enemies, security interests, national interests. It's not a new question, it's not a new issue. We have been engaged in it since the establishment of the state, and yet in recent times we feel perhaps Perhaps that there is a multiplicity of offers or suggestions that seem to have clear preference to the national interest. And there are examples, uh, things like that, that seem like collective punishment, uh, like uh, punishing families even if they are not connected to a terrorist attack, and the refugees and infiltrators, and even we don't even we can't even say we don't even know if they're called infiltrators or asylum seekers. There is huge preference to national interest, even though there are other considerations as well to be taken into um, in, in consideration. We all heard the Minister of ben uh, Minister Bennett yesterday. Is there maybe too much politicization? Maybe uh, should these considerations even be taken into consideration? So is there something that is um, problematic with uh, having human rights sort of put under one law? I think that every single one of the subjects or topics here on the screen, I mean, it's amazing that we're even asking how this is supposed to solve our problems. I mean, there's a whole list here of populist sort of... Um, slogans and, and some nonsense and it just reflects how sick our politics is because those who are making the policies are just uh, throwing red meat out to their base that's all they care about and I'm very concerned about that as an Israeli I think it should be of concern to anyone in this room that the people, the decision makers in Israel don't want to resolve problems because policy instruments cannot actually be used so deporting Terrorists' families. I heard. Gen I heard. I hear. Hear primaries of generals. The head of the, I the ISA, the Shabak, continues to say that this instrument is not is not helpful. In fact, it's in the way. And yet, we see members of Knesset and the Minister of Defense and the Prime Minister tweeting and talking about the holy power they have in order to tweet nonsense and to constantly just redirect the conversation because they don't have an advantage. Holding or detaining infiltrators uh, lim without limit. Miri Regev, throughout her term in office, when she was at the head of the internal committee or committee of the interior, had brought into Israel hundreds of thousands of foreign workers. We are constantly engaging in nonsense. It seems like maybe Bennett will come along or Minister Shaked will come along and they'll say, we want to control. We want to be in control. We are currently controlling. And as 
seems to emerge uh, very accurately that a democracy is not the rule of the majority, it's the people's rule. And even a majority, they don't have, I and mean, they have a majority in parliament right now because of a 61 member coalition. But most of the public wants public transportation on Saturday. 58% from what I saw in Europe poll want or support the two state solution, and yet all of these values of the majority are not actually expressed in this government's policy. We're always hearing about controlling, but you should not be aiming for controlling, you should be aiming for servicing, for, for providing service, rendering service to the public. And if you cannot do that, then you are not worthy of being in the, in the regime, in the right wing, that is. And we're asking, we should be asking ourselves, why are we not trying to solve these troubling issues that we're facing? How is it that we have come to the situation where the political camp, the right wing, is so busy really morbidly obsessing with hate, with going after the left and the infiltrators and the judges and the media. They have nothing positive to say. And that is really troubling. And we really should be, you know, revisiting this, trying to see how it is that we are constantly talking about hate and about burning the legitimization of anyone who tries to criticize. I mean, you can have a discussion to the point about deporting members of family of terrorists. But let us not only apply it to Jews and bad guys. Let us talk about maybe the families of Jewish terrorists. Can we have that conversation? It's very interesting. Of course, it's not even on the table. So if we're trying to deal with terrorism, let us see how we can do it. I think that Israel's enemies can be really grateful for us and smile broadly when they see the internal arguments we're having because terrorism is to actually gnaw and make crumble this resilience we have. And if we are constantly engaged in nonsense and rubbish, all these topics that are on the screen are of no interest to the Israeli public. People are not going to vote in these elections over the issue of where the the, uh, the refugees will be. Will they be sitting in Holon detention center or in the Tel Aviv central bus station? I mean, the, the movement in Tel Aviv, the party in Tel Aviv that was going with this ticket in the municipal elections didn't get a single seat in the Tel Aviv council. Look at people who are getting beaten up by... Um, by settlers. I mean, that should be something that we should be talking about. And we're we seem to be only focusing on what comes out of the minds of political advisors who are constantly busy with hate. And we should be placing the emphasis elsewhere. Thank you very much. Sarah. Good morning. I am not uh, in a position to say what the Israeli public wants or what they're interested in because I'm certain that where I live in and uh, where you are living in, everyone in this audience is, is different and you each have your own cab driver, you each have your own um, maybe hairdresser. And each of you is having their own conversations and reading the polls you want to read. And I would like to talk. I mean, it's amazing to me that we are talking about the human rights, as I'm reading here on the screen, the human rights of others, enemies, foreigners, because and, and whether uh, Israeli democracy is in danger. I mean, the actual question, the mere question, is a wonder to me. I want to tell you about an amazing man who was called Dror Weinberg. He was the head of the Hebron battalion when I was in the army, when I was, and I came from the Kiryat Arba originally, and Dror Weinberg was really a legendary commander, and he um, was killed in action, and he did not believe in checkpoints. He didn't believe in oppressing civilians. He believed in trying to make contact. He was a man who was deeply rooted in values and ideology, and he managed to make a better life and security without giving up an inch 
of security or anything else. Dror Weinberg knew how to balance beautifully determined fighting and combat, you know, campaigning against terrorists, and he realized they were just a very tiny minority of Hebron inhabitants, while giving a better life, better conditions for the civilians living in Hebron. And he managed to do it. He managed to do it by taking away checkpoints. And in fact, why am I telling you all about him, even though I really admire the man? It's because the state of Israel should aspire exactly to that model. And about deporting families of terrorists, yes or no, here it says uh, the last item on the list is freedom of action in the use of force. Because when we demand values, when we don't want to compromise, when we use force, when we are com have legitimacy, I mean, sometimes we are in existential national survival. I mean, right now we're talking about popular ter terrorism and stabbings, and thank God, I hope it won't get worse. But I grew up when the years were much bloodier, and we managed to stop the Second Intifada not by limiting force, but because of um, protective shield. And we had to use force. And still, and maybe paradoxically so, what will bring about peace, what will bring about human rights, what will bring about democracy and strengthen Israeli democracy is using force cleverly, wisely, and not compromising on that. And maybe you see a kind of extremism, but I really see um, a, a sort of a um, gnawing at or a sort of crumbling of our, of our force. Because in the past, we used to um, demolish or, de or, or destroy a family's home, a family of terrorists' uh, home, as an act of deterrence, and now we're not. We're waiting to do it. We don't know how to do it, even if after they do the terrorist act. So if we don't do it, we shouldn't be doing it as a punitive act. We should be doing it as, a deter as an act of deterrence. If we don't do that, if we don't destroy the homes of terrorists, and they're very few and far between, we will have to place more checkpoints. We would have to be far less humane to more. You know, in our interaction with more, po with a greater population that is not involved in terrorism, and there's no one here in this audience, or even in the of Israel. And here, I will speak on behalf of the public. No one has an interest for the public, the Arab public, that is living away outside of the green lines. We don't want them to suffer. No one here has the interest to have them suffer. Last sentence, Sarah? Yes, very last sentence. Israel is an anchor. It is a democratic anchor in the Middle East. It is an anchor of stability in the Middle East. And therefore, it should not apologize for its values or for its security or for its use of force because there is nothing that will bring peace quicker and strengthen democracy better than assertively using force and doing so wisely. Thank you. Very briefly, how do you balance between these opinions? Well, the matter at hand is the human rights of enemies slash foreigners. And we need to distinguish between foreigners or others and enemies. Because the human rights of foreigners, should we should not go too far with. It is a basic foundation of Judaism. We need only go to our own Jewish um, you know, uh, uh, holy scriptures, we all have the five books of Moses at home, and if you read it, you'll see just how important human rights are. The Torah, the five books of Moses, repeat again and again that we should not defraud, we should not cheat foreigners, and, they s and it says again and again that we must remember that we ourselves were foreigners in the land of Egypt, and moreover, it says again and again in the Torah that you should not cheat and you should not... Um, Defraud foreigners because you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. But not only in the land of Egypt, we were also foreigners throughout 2,000 years of exile everywhere we went, and we were always persecuted. And you should understand the foreigners and the soul and heart of foreigners. And therefore, human rights is I mean, you cannot have a Jewish state without 
keeping these human rights and without providing them because it is the very basis of Jewish morals and democracy. And therefore, I think that as Jewish state, of course, there is no perfect country and there is no perfect person. And this needs to be attended to more. But all in all, I think Israel does honor human rights and particularly the justice system makes sure of it. We only heard a few moments ago in um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Esther Chayut's presentation that it's happening. And yet we haven't managed to do the override clause or anything like that and to pass them and what's happening with us to the Supreme Court. Now, the matter of the enemy is a completely different matter. An enemy is an enemy. They are against you. I can only quote the Honorable Chief Justice who said, and I hope you all listened attentively, it was a fascinating presentation. She said the State of Israel since its establishment and to this day has been facing existential threats. So it's not just Iran or other nations who want to annihilate us and they can do so within just a few days. There are voices around the world, not only in Iran, not only in Islam, but also in the United States. We hear voices saying that the establishment of the State of Israel was a mistake that should be rectified. Therefore, the State of Israel, of course, should know who the enemies are, and against them we must fight. However, as the Chief Justice said so correctly, the situation in Israel is so, and the situation in the IDF is so, meaning that even when we shoot, there is a law. And that is how we conduct ourselves. And I will just end with a sentence, I mean, the Chief Justice said so, but I just want to quote the issue as it w uh, that was addressed by uh, Justice Aaron Barak when I finished my studies at Barlan University. We had Aaron Barak come to to our uh, graduation ceremony, and he said we must strike a balance between the need to fight terrorism and overcome it and keeping the law. And then he said this amazing sentence, and with that I will end. He said, we must not sacrifice human rights on the altar of the Israeli security, but we must also not sacrifice Israel's security on the altar of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let us, because for lack of time, let us move on to the third issue, which connects to what you just said and to the presentation of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and that is the independence of the legal system and the gatekeepers. Because if there is really an issue where, particularly recently, the public is very much aware and alert, to what extent is there really an attempt to try and undermine the um, status of the legal system and whoever is trying to keep the law and to enforce the law in this uh, country. We have the override uh, um, clause, which means that even if a law is un unconstitutional, the Knesset will be able to override it, and override the Supreme Court or the High Court of Justice and to uh, legislate it anyway. And this whole sensational matter of appointing the judges, but this whole attempt of trying to um, influence influence the appointment of judges that many are concerned about, and all in all, the discourse that seems to be very heated, even within the system, against the Supreme Court. Some say that the criticism should maybe be said differently, but the Supreme Court has really um, you know, gone too far, and some say try, that there has been an attempt to try and hurt democracy. So let us maybe uh, you know, do a different round a little differently. Let's start with Bendol. In my first lesson in constitutional law, I was told, I was taught, I, in fact, the entire class was taught, and there are many um, legal professionals here, we were taught that we must safe keep not only the rule of the majority, but also, we need to make sure because the majority could be dangerous. And why? Because it is something very neutral, because it might hurt the rights of the redheads. They took an example in our lesson. That was the example used. Of course, you can use any other example you like. And therefore, we hear this again and again and again, and we heard it today more than once, that a democracy is not just the rule of the majority, but it's also safekeeping or guarding or honoring human rights and minorities' rights. And it's true, there is no 
um, argument about that. But the problem is at the next level. At the next level, we're told, listen, politicians are dangerous. And therefore, we need people who will sort of guard them. And they will make the decisions, and they will be the ones who will save us all from the tyranny of the majority, from the tyranny of politicians. And that's interesting, and that theoretically is very true. But there's only one problem with this story. It doesn't always have much connection with reality. I don't like many of the legislations mentioned in, 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 that emerged here. I don't like them much. However, I do honor democracy. I respect it. And when I look back retrospectively at history, what happened? Have courts of law, have judges ever saved democracy from the claws? of the dangerous majority? I mean, what can we do? What, was taught, what I was taught was good in order to justify a new kind of a rule of judges, of, of bureaucracy, a new form of bureaucracy. Because in the big crisis that um, preempted the civil war in the United States, and, um, there was a slave, and the Congress uh, had the Missouri law, and the legislators decided that as a first step in order to free slaves came the court in the United States that was supposed to protect us and decided that a slave is an object. And what the Congress decided, those legislators who are cruel and dangerous, supposedly, is that this is completely un unconstitutional and therefore, being an object, they will return to slavery. And then Abraham Lincoln, not exactly the enemy of democracy, said, if instead of, and I'm not quoting him, you know, uh, verbatim, but if instead of a democratic regime we will have a bureaucracy, we will not have democracy. And you know what happened? The civil war broke out. And it's not an example that's only true for over 150 years ago. These examples take place now. And I will skip over a few other international law affairs and I will go to what happened 10 years ago. Just one minute, please. The Supreme Court in the United States decided that a Congress decision that says that the donations of corporations should be limited is not constitutional. What did the Congress want? Both parties wanted to say, listen, we don't want to have excess involvement of uh, moguls in, uh, in tycoons in democracy and in politics. And who was the one who was so blatant against, blatantly against the Supreme Court? It was Obama, a well-known liberal, and it was an op-ed in the New York Times, and there were many legal professionals. So this sort of fable, this sort of uh, uh, folktale that the judges keep say, say to keep democracy better than legislators is not always true. It's not always true in reality. And the late judge Menachem Elon, there was a, he said there was a big difference in an argument he had with the president of the Supreme Court, Aharon Barak. He said there's a big difference between bureaucracy and uh, the rule of judgment. Well, Aharon Barak chose bureaucracy, and Menachem Elon and myself choose the rule of judgment. Thank you very much. Listen, democracies, liberal democracies, don't collapse in a single day. You don't just wake up in the morning and realize your country is no longer democratic. They are slowly eroded, gradually, so that we sometimes don't even feel it. We don't feel it. One law against human rights, weakening the people who need to safeguard us. Maybe they're gatekeepers for a moment until the next day we decide they're not. We limit force just a little bit. And here there's another legislation about the media. And then you limit the freedom to go to court. 
And then, within a year or two, you realize that your country, which you knew as a liberal democracy, is no longer the same. And we don't need to travel too far. Look at what's happening in Europe. And please place special attention on countries like Hungary and Poland. Just look what is going on there and what has happened there in the last two years. One, one and a half pages of summary of what happened in these countries, what's happening there now, and what happened to bureaucracy, so to speak. And what are we hearing here? We are hearing every day that the court won't let the, the state breathe. We have to overcome it. We were elected to rule and we cannot make any resolutions. It's impossible for a court to be telling us what to do all the time. It's impossible for us to have a bureaucracy. We cannot have the court um, uh, cancelling or, or, or annulling our laws. And it seems that whatever doesn't work right here, it's because of the court. I don't think that there has ever been so few responsible for so many failures. And therefore, the suggestion is let us overcome the Supreme Court. And I want to say in a couple of minutes I have been given to address this matter of the override clause, because I want to explain to those here who are not legal professionals exactly what we are going to override. We have basic laws. They are actually the unwritten constitution of Israel. It is weak, it is incomplete, but it is a constitution nevertheless. And in the basic rights, we, the basic laws, we have human rights, like freedom of speech, freedom of possession, honor, life. And these rights, as we heard this morning, are not absolute. Everything is relative. I don't have 100% freedom of expression, and nor does my friend Ben Yamini. We have limited rights, and who can limit us? The regime. And why? Because they have interests that they too should be protected. The regime can limit our possession and, uh, and our property because they want to have a road going through our property. And they can limit the Palestinians' freedom because by their fence, by their garden, they want to have a security fence set up. You are allowed to certainly harm human rights in every democratic country. You balance between the interest of the regime and human rights. And how do you do it? Well, according to our basic laws, our rights can be uh, hurt, can be injured if it is appropriate and if it's just a little bit not um, completely extremely. And that's the way we've been working for 25 years. We have been having our rights limited for worthy purposes. And that's why there's no problem. There are many laws that injure our human rights. And there are more laws that don't hurt human rights and uh, th those that do. But it is appropriate so we can, uh, and proportional so we are willing to um, to have it do so. But what happens if it's unproportional, disproportionate? Then the court says, what you did to the infiltrators, for example, to catch them because of their color, to put them in a facility. It's called a facility, but it's actually a jail in Cholot. That is disproportionate, that is unproportional, and you haven't even tried them uh, just because they infiltrated. If they didn't get, to, get to their day in court, that is disproportional, and that's, that's why it is cancelled. And that's why it is being cancelled. So what is the override clause? What does it say? It says that the Knesset, the parliament in Israel, will be able to legislate laws that hurt our rights extremely, disproportionately, for causes that are not worthy, and the court will not be able to cancel these laws. So the override clause that says we just want to override the Supreme Court, that's not the truth. The truth is they want to override us to overcome us. It is a clause that is designed to allow the regime to hurt each and every one of our rights, not just the rights of minorities, the rights of each and every one of us here in this room. And each of, each of us is a minority. And I would like to end with some hope that we'll only talk about coming together and not overriding. Thank you very much. Chief Justice Chayut this morning opened by saying that the legal system should be independent, and that is certainly very, very important. But independence does not mean supremacy. If someone thinks that a legal system should have complete supremacy, that it can always say the last word and decide the rules of the game, and 
you know, you have the last word on every resolution that was, uh, that was uh, approved democratically, it means that you don't have a democracy anymore, that you have a monarchy. You need a strong court in Israel, but not one that is above all rules. And we are completely off balance now in Israel, both relatively to other countries, even though in the Western world you have to admit that there is a trend going on of legalization, but we are doing it so much more. It's like the heritage that some Jews have lived on, on Torah and having uh, attributing too much importance to the decisions of the sages of the rabbis are kind of trickling down in a secular version to those who wear uh, the robes of judges. And there should be a mechanism of a court, and the court should say that it should be given concrete judgments. But the rules should always be according to democratic values. And we're living in the only country in the world where the Supreme Court has declared a constitution. In all the countries of the world, almost, there is a constitution. But people voted for it. We're the only country where there was no actual conscious decision to have a constitution. And if you talked about the uh, um, national nation state law that 62 uh, members of Knesset have passed, uh, have passed and other laws, the 32 laws were voted for. People said that they didn't realize that they would have attributed to us three and a half years later that the majority opinion is that what you actually voted for was a constitution. So we're in a world where the court creates a constitution. Constitution. And now we have a new idea emerging that so the basic laws are constitution, are the constitution, but I can even overrule basic laws. They started with the biannual budget, which is a bit more of a formality, and now we are having an 11 uh, judge uh, team that are saying that they can also rule against basic laws. And if the basic laws are the constitution, so what's going on? And the activism in Israel is too much and so is the uh, advisory one. We are living in a country where there is a practice that was supported by court rulings whereby the attorney general's uh, decisions bind the government. I'm not talking about him as a uh, criminal prosecutor. Here obviously he has to be independent and I think there should maybe even be two people in these two capacities. But in terms of advising legal, the being a legal advisor of the government to have their opinion as the binding one, it's absurd. The court ends up talking and discussing the legality of the government's actions, and then they're asking whether it is actually um, fair or not. And in this discussion, it doesn't even hear what the government has to say, because the person representing the government is the, gen the attorney general, who is authorized to speak on behalf of the government and give its complete opposite position, like uh, an event. Let's say that Minister Akunis decides not to appoint Professor Yael Amitai to a certain professional position in his office, in his ministry, and the appeal was not that he, it was not his authority to do so, but whether he was reasonable in thinking so. So it's a matter, I mean, there's a person's um, discretion, uh, it should be discussed uh, and deliberated by a court, and then the Attorney General says, on the behalf of the minister, I'm saying that the uh, those who appealed are right. So it's completely off balance, and Israel must become balanced. Override is one model of balance. But the better model of balance, and it's a shame that I can't talk about the override, but the better model and the more common model of balance is a different method of appointing judges. Israel is weird in that sense uh, when you compare it to the OECD. Appointing judges in the United States, judges are approved by the Senate. In Germany, it is the Parliament, it is the Congress, and we don't see these democracies going bankrupt. We have six, six minutes. 
left for this uh, session uh, regarding uh, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, I think uh, this is quite agreed that uh, we have it, and uh, this is an evidence, the mere discussion here. But there is a feeling that uh, there's an attempt to limit uh, criticism, uh, critics, and legitimacy to civil society, to human rights. They all uh, perhaps raise a fear that maybe there is some noise in this freedom, and I'm really going to be very strict. Two sentences each. Well, I would have given uh, it all to Ben Dror uh, all time, but if you insist, I don't see it as a harm to democracy, but as a democracy that is defending itself. We need to understand that is in the international arena, we are disproportional uh, regarding our influence, who we are, if you want to look at the UN Council of Human Rights or the UN at large. Uh, this course around human rights, I'm um, maybe I would like to put an, a question mark over those organizations who define themselves as human rights organizations because as far as I see it, what they do to human rights is belittling the very important term called human rights, which I care about no less than any other person. What is happening right now in the state of Israel is that there are foreign governors who finance uh, civil organizations, and in a declared fashion, their goal is to overflow the judicial system. Isn't this harming democracy? Let's alter the vector, let's alter the direction, and this is the story. Should we limit, how should we do it, limiting an entrance to Israel? This was a question that was posed to us to begin with. Limiting uh, those who are anti-Israeli, who are boycotting Israeli, it happens elsewhere. We, we did not invent the will uh, limitation on are in Switzerland as well, or a full bathing suit, which is a modest one in France. It exists in Israel, it does not. So a little bit proportion in this entirety. Uh, we can talk about limiting those who criticize Israel, who are work operating against Israel to be precise, and we can definitely talk about the discourse of those who define themselves as human rights activists, a very fluid kind of a concept. We're not a human rights organization, we are a research institute. Here you are weakening the weakened, and uh, only those who are weak uh, are concerned by criticism. If we were strong with good policy, we would have um, not cared about any criticism. Israel has a problem of policy, not of uh, PR. The Israeli public at large does not uh, agree with its policy, and this is why it's very difficult to explain to the world the issue of several students of Berkeley coming here annually, or non-important organizations who do non-important things that nobody cares about. This is exactly the example of a noise machine and diverting the real issue. Uh, we have Aviad Bakshi who wrote Nation State Law. I don't know how many people here in the room wrote a Nation State Law. He rewrote uh, the uh, book in the curriculum of the of high school uh, students of uh, uh, civil uh, studies. The Prime Minister uh, yesterday uh, took in a campaign of the My Israel movement, and we're still hearing from all those unrecognized entities who are weakening us. You're so strong, you have so much power. If you cannot, with all of this might to resolve the problems kindly, allow those who can. We cannot all the time uh, to uh, cry about this, to uh, say that we are so very... Um, there is a policy that we need to activate, but what is the problem? We cannot discuss the policy, because this policy includes things that the base is not allowed to discuss. The policy for resolving the conflict 
include um, evacuating settlements and reaching two states. And this is something we cannot talk about. So when we cannot really talk about this, we need to talk about all sorts of stupid things like which student would go to study at the Hebrew University. Ultimately, she did go to the Hebrew University. So we keep on filling our time with those delirious things. So I'm asking if you're so strong, what's the problem in resolving the issues? Thank you. Ben Dro. Well, two minutes. Well, I admit the previous question has to do with this one, and the question many times is that of checks and balances. Professor Harari said uh, in the beginning of the morning that there is some sort of belittling of this value called human rights, and I'm sorry that that's the case, because when I hear human rights, I know that the following sentence will many times, I don't want to generalize, not 100%, but many of the times the next sentence is going to be something which is so anti-Israeli and so much part of those uh, lies industry, that's the way I call it. And it's a shame, it's a real shame for all of us, everyone who wants the right balance. And this ties in with the previous question, uh, also relating to the Supreme Court and their uh, authority in cancelling laws or ruling about the freedom of speech. I want uh, the courts to have uh, this power, but I want it to be reined enough so that it's not everything can be judged and so that we find this point of balance where most public supports the ruling of the Supreme Court. And Unfortunately, in all sorts of ruling, they, uh, the Supreme Court hurt itself because of overruling, because of this uh, judicial imperialism. And it's a shame because we all lose here freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a very important thing. But we also have this international comparison, and in international comparison, and I was really searching for it, I couldn't find a country which is financing uh, artists, creators who are a, against the mere existence of their country. I couldn't find any of that. So I don't vote for Miri Regev. But what can one do? 5% of the things that she say, she's right. It's very difficult to say it in this uh, hall, I know, but things must be said. And when there is an American president, it's called Finley, and not going into details because you're pushing me for time, even the American Supreme Court, which has some uh, good and right decisions, decided very explicitly, sorry, the country's authority is to maintain the joint values and the country can also, and it is financed by the country. There's no harm to the freedom of speech. You can do whatever you want, but there is no obligation on the side of the state to finance it. In France, nobody finances the anti-Semitic Diodonné, and no petition for the freedom of speech of Diodonné, the anti-Semitic Diodonné, will be ever accepted. Thank you very much. Well, they say I must finish, but uh, I promised one sentence. The state of Israel is financing uh, an attack on its mere existence and on democracy and racism of the lowest kind and harm to human rights. It is paying for it all. It is a country of all its enemies. And there is a problem there. But if I have to do the overall math, uh, is it good to try and limit it by uh, legislation from the home of Miri Regev? I think we shouldn't do it. Uh, human rights organizations, sometimes they have a lot of uh, criticism uh, on their activity in Israel and abroad. And I thought that the law that required human rights organizations to expose their external financing factors is the right one. I'm sorry it didn't include the same requirement for those who receive money not from government but rather from people, because nowadays, according to the law, an Israeli organization that is being financed by uh, anti-Semitic uh, Danish organization does not need to report it. But if it receives uh, uh, some financing from the government, the Danish government, it has to report. I think the public should know both. Thank you. And I really hope that the discussion on the democratic uh, state of things will continue.